Luke chapter 5, be thinking about a, this day that changed their life forever. Luke 5 and 1 says this, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were fishing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he being Jesus, asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with them were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, and who were partners with Simon. How many know that was a life-changing day for them? Amen. Their life would never be the same after what they witnessed and what they saw. But it's really what took place next that really changed the course of their life. Look at verse 10, and I'll preach this morning. And... And also were the sons of, of John, sons of Zebedee, and who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything behind and followed him. In the King James, it says that do not be afraid. From now on, you shall be fishers of men. You shall be fishers of men. This morning, I'd like to preach to you on the life-changing day for Peter, James, and John, and Andrew that caused them to become fishers of men. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we've gathered together. Thank you for what you've already done, God, how you've already moved and how you've drawn men and women, boys and girls to you already this morning and those that have found refuge in you, those that have shed tears crying out to you. And I thank you for that. Lord, we pray now that as we have uh, broke the bread of life, Lord, that you would move and you would minister. God, that you would, that you would challenge and encourage and bless your people. Lord, I thank you for those that have come hungry this morning. I thank you for those... Lord, they didn't come to hear from a pastor. They've come to hear from you. God, they, they, they need direction in their lives, and, and uh, we're, we're busy, and, and we, want, we want to set aside the Sabbath for you, God. And so I pray that you will be faithful to your people today. Feed them, God, and do what only you can do in this place. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This was a life-changing day for these fishermen. They had been out fishing all the night and had caught nothing. How many of you ever been there before? I mean, man, you, you've, you, you got all the gear together and you got everything set aside and you go out fishing and, man, you, you believe you're going uh, to fill up the, the, the car on the way home with fish and, and you're there and hour after hour goes by and, and nothing happens. Man, it's discouraging, isn't it? Fishing is fun while you're catching fish. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really good time. Uh, but these guys, here they are, and I, I just imagine them, they're hanging their heads. And, now listen, let's, let's, let's be reminded, these were for professional fishermen. These just weren't your average guys that, that, that were out fishing on a boat. These guys, this is how they made their living. This was how that they, they, they financed their lives was through fishing. And they knew all the places to go. They knew all the right techniques. They knew how to catch fish because this is how, that they, lived their, how they made their living. And, and so here they were. They had been out all night. And, 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 and I imagine as they're cleaning their nets. And, and here they are there by the lakeside. And, and, and I can just see their heads are just hanging low. They're just a little discouraged. Because there's going to be no food on the table from this night. 
I mean, there is going to be no surplus. There, there, there's going to be no sale that's going to take place. And, and, and they're probably discouraged and fighting and fussing amongst one another and wondering why they didn't catch anything. And, and, and next thing you know, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speaks to him and says, put your boat out a little bit and let me teach the Word of God. And here he is, and, and he's teaching the Word of God to the multitudes. And, and one of the things that I love about Luke chapter 5 is that we find a people that are hungry for the Word of God. The Bible says there was a great crowd that had gathered around to hear the Word of God. I believe that our country still wants to hear the Word of God. They don't want to hear a, a, a lot of preferences. They don't want to hear uh, what a man seems to think. They want to hear what the Word of God says. And here is Jesus. He is expounding the Word of God. And there's a great crowd that has gathered around. And as he has done finishing teaching the Word of God, notice he, he, he beckons Peter. He says, Peter, put your boat out a little bit. Notice in, in, in verse 4 it says, And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put it out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Peter begins to argue with the Lord for just a second. Any of you ever been there before? I mean, God tells you to do something. You're like, well, Lord, I've, I've already tried this and I've already done this. And are you sure, God? How many know that we don't need to question God when he tells us to do something? God knows what he's doing. He is sovereign. He's all-powerful. And, and here is Peter, and he, and he replies back, Master, we have toiled all night and, we, and, and took nothing. I mean, can you really blame him? He's a professional fisherman. I mean, he, he's, he's just a few minutes from being back uh, into the land, and, and, and he caught nothing. And now here's Jesus telling him to go back out and to, and to cast his nets out, and there's going to be a great catch. And, and so Peter says, we toiled all the night and took nothing. But notice what he says next. But at your word, I will let down the nets. God, I don't understand, but I'm just going to do what you've told me to do. How many of there's going to be a lot of times in life that we don't understand why we need to do what God tells us we need to do, but we just need to be obedient. Because there's always blessings that follow obedience. And so here is Peter, and, 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 and he didn't agree, and, and he didn't understand why, but, but he says, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, a multitude of fish, so that their nets were breaking. And they even signaled to their partners, and they said, hey, come on over and help us. And, and they came, and they filled up both of the boats so that they had began to sink. Can you imagine how their life changed that day? Can you imagine the miracle that had just taken place if you think that they had fished all the night and caught nothing, but now at the word of Christ, that they had not only had a great catch, but both of the boats were beginning to sink. And I love Peter's response. Verse number 8, but when Peter, Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know what, what we see here from the scripture is that one of the signs of, of, of Peter's uh, genuine faith in God is that he was humbled. See, a true Christian is humbled by success whereby others are lifted up in pride. And they kind of take credit for what God does through them. And here is Peter, he is humbled and he, and, he, and he can't believe it. And so what does he do? He acknowledges his own sinfulness. He says, depart from me, Jesus. I am a sinful man. I am an unclean man. And, 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 and notice verse number 9. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. They were blown away. They were amazed at, at, at what had just taken place. And then verse number 10, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And, and it says, and Jesus said to Simon, notice this, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers of men or you will be catching men. This was a day that changed their life forever. This was the day that they became fishers of men. Aren't you thankful that, that the Lord ministers, ministers to us in ways that we can understand? Yeah. When God begins to deal with us, he begins to deal with us in ways that we can understand. And, and this was the way that Peter, James, and John, and Andrew could understand. They knew what it meant to fish. And so Jesus gets down on their level and he says, this day your life is going to change for the rest of your life. From now on, you used to catch fish, 
But from now on, you will be fishers of men. And so this morning, with God's help, I'd like to, to share on what it means to be a fisher of men. You see, that's really what God has called us to do as the body of Christ. See, sometimes that we can really lose focus on what God has really called us to do, what God, what his plan is for us. And, and we should never uh, compromise and, and we should never become complacent with, with the calling of God on our lives. And so I want to look this morning at some aspects. This is basic stuff. You're not going to hear anything this morning that you didn't already know. I can tell you that up front. So if you're looking for some deep insight, uh, something maybe that you've never known before, forget about it. This is going to be basic. We're going to go back to the basics and, and we're going to get a glimpse of what it, what it really means to be a, become a fisher of men. The first thing that I want you to see is number one, fishing requires going. Fishing requires going. If you want to catch fish, you have to go in order to catch fish. Amen? What do you mean, preacher? Well, listen, you have to go to a lake. You have to go to a pond. You have to go to a river. You have to go to an ocean. You have to go to some sort of body of water. Why? Because that's where the fish live. Amen. How many know you don't sit on your couch and catch fish? Thank all three of you for the amen. No, if you're going to catch fish, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to go to where the fish are. And this is what God is saying, is from now on, you're going to become fishers of men, but you're going to have to go where the men are at. You can't stay put if you're going to be the fisherman. No, this is, this is really the great commission. This is what God is calling his disciples to do. And, and, and this is the call to evangelism. Notice the great commission. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. See, you can't stay where you're at and go at the same time. You have to go, and, and if we're going to be fishers of men, we have to learn what it means to go into all the world. We have to learn what it means to go into the highways, into the hedges. And, and, and sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll get this mindset that, that we gather together as a church and that we pray for, for lost people to come into the church. Everybody look right up here. In the same way that a criminal is not just going to show up to the police station, Lost people are not going to show up to the church. Why? Because they're guilty. It was the last thing on my mind. If I had not been invited, if, if somebody had not uh, petitioned me and, and gave me that invitation, I wouldn't be saved today, but somebody was encouraging me. Somebody was inviting me to come to the Lord. The reality is I just wasn't going to show up to the church. Why? Because I'm guilty. Man, my sins had condemned me. I knew that the life that I was living was not pleasing to God. It was not honoring to the Lord. And, and the reality is, it, it, it's just like the guy that has a warrant for his arrest. The last place he's going to show up is to the police station. Okay? But sometimes what we do is we gather together as a church and we say, God, we want you to fill the pews up. And, 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 and you know what God's response is to that? Go. You want to fill the pews up, go into the highways and the hedges and preach the gospel. And, and, and sometimes us praying for God to fill up the pews, it, 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 it's so, uh, it's just like somebody that's sitting on their couch saying, God, I want to catch some fish. If you want to catch fish, you have to go. What are you saying? Fishing requires going. That means that you have to go to where the fish are. You can't expect the fish. Now, I don't know about you. But once or twice in my life, and I, I tried to find it, and I couldn't really find a good, but, but I have seen evidence, and I have seen videos of guys that are driving their boats down bodies of water and fish jumping into the boat. How many know that's the exception to the rule? How many know that don't happen very often where the fish just jumps into the boat and you don't even have to do anything? Hey, Amen. Once in a while, it happens. Once in a while, people drift their way in to the church but as a rule what we find out is that fishing requires going and we have to go into the highways and the hedges see God's plan to reach the world with the gospel involves believers going to the lost and dying world and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and so I think we have to ask ourselves a serious question have we lost our desire to go as believers have we lost our desire to go 
And the reality is, is that we have not only a, a suggestion, but a mandate, a command from God to carry the gospel with us as we walk through life. See, here's the thing. You don't just have to go out into the street corner. People are scared to death to have to go out to somebody and just start preaching to people. That's not what God wants us to do. What God wants us to do is to carry the gospel as we walk through life. As we live life, as we, as we go to the gym, we can share the gospel. As we go to our jobs, we can share the gospel. We don't have to shove the gospel down anybody's throat. We don't have to be confrontational with the gospel. We live our lives and we allow the gospel to live through us and we build relationships with people around us. People are scared to death of this idea that when God says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, that somehow that, that God is saying, you need to go onto the street corner and just start preaching to people about Jesus. That's not what God is saying. Now, there are some people that may be gifted to go out onto the street corner and preach to people about Jesus. They would be people that have the gift of evangelism in Scripture. There is a gift that God gives to certain individuals. They have the gift of evangelism. They can go up to a complete stranger and talk to them, and within 20 to 30 seconds, they can begin sharing the gospel with them. Not everybody has that gift. Not everybody's comfortable sharing the gospel that way. And guess what? You don't have to feel guilty if you don't share the gospel that way. Sometimes the church makes you feel super, super guilty and wants to put you down if you don't share the gospel in the way they think you should share the gospel. But the reality is that's not the way that you have to share the gospel. There are other ways, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But the reality is, is that we need to share the gospel as we walk through life. Through our children, as, 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 as we, we preach the gospel to our children as we live, through, live our lives, and, and through our jobs, and as we go to the marketplace, and, and, and as we simply live life, we can absolutely share the gospel. But we have to go. See, the reality is that we cannot sit, we cannot stay where we're at. We, we, we cannot be recluse, if you will, and, and expect the lost to be saved. Fishing requires going. It's going into the world and sharing the gospel. It's God taking our lives uh, and, and using them, using our lives for the glory of God. And so the first thing that we see, very basic, is that fishing requires going. It's part of the Great Commission. It's the mandate of God. This is God's plan for his salvation to be extended into the world is that God uses you and I to carry the gospel as we live our lives. The second thing that I want you to write down is number two, fishing requires a hook. How many know if you just throw a line in the water, you're not going to catch any fish? Help me, somebody. But if you bait your hook, there's always an opportunity for a catch. You've got to learn how to bait the hook. And see, in the fishing world, there are all types of bait. You have live bait. You have lures, plastic worms, jigs, chicken livers, hot dogs. I, I mean, the list goes on and on. Some people use peanut butter and all sorts of different things. But the reality is, is that every different type of bait needs a hook. Amen? Any of you ever went fishing and just fed the fish because you couldn't keep your bait on the hook? I mean, there goes your chicken liver. There goes your hot dog. And it's like, man, all you're doing is feeding the fish. It's got to be it. Listen, the bait has to be attached to the hook. See, there's a lot of different, the bait is the different styles of evangelism the, the 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 bait is the different flavors if you will of ways to share the share the gospel but there's only one hook and that's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ there is only one way that God can really reach a soul and that is through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ people need gospel conviction to be converted to the Lord Jesus Christ and the reality is is that if the church does not preach the gospel if we do not witness the gospel nobody can be saved and, and so it doesn't matter how big the church is you can have a church of 30,000 people and somebody can be standing up motivationally speaking but, but the reality is, is the, if the gospel is not being presented, it's like throwing out a line without a hook. Nobody can be saved. Nobody can come to the Lord. And, and the reality is, is that, that gospel conviction has to grip a person's heart in order for them to be saved. A, a person, now I want to make this very, very clear. A person has to be confronted with their sin before that they can be, uh, be saved. This is what the Bible teaches, and, and, and our culture has become so softened 
The Christianity has become so watered down that we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. And I'm not saying that we should go out of our way to be confrontational, but as we share the gospel, as we preach the gospel, there are going to be times it's going to be offensive. I mean, I was the day I got saved, I was offended because God showed me my sin. God showed me the error of my way, and he brought me to a place where I could repent of my sin and put my faith in Christ for forgiveness. But if we water down the message and if we all always talk about the good things and the blessings of God and the prosperity of God, what we're doing is that we're throwing out the line, but there's no hook on it. And guess what? You're never going to catch anything if you don't have a hook on the line. What is the hook? The hook is the gospel. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. People have to understand that Jesus Christ came, that he lived a perfect life, that he went to the cross, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected on the third day for the forgiveness of their sins. And we see this presented in, in the very first time after God instituted the church in Acts chapter 2. The very first time that we see somebody saved after God organized and structured his church is in Acts chapter 2. And I want to read it to you. I want you to follow along with me. Acts chapter 2. Go ahead and flip there. I'll give you just a second. Acts chapter 2. We see the Spirit of God fell down upon uh, the people of God. And, and, and God ordained and established his church. And, and Peter uh, preaches a, a sermon from uh, Acts 22 uh, and 22. And, and, and he begins to, to talk about um, sin and, and, and the price of sin. And, and this is what I want to call your attention to. In verse number 37, this is following Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the hook of the gospel had cut them to the heart. And so the only way that they could respond to that was through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and here's what I would suggest to you today, that if we are not preaching the gospel and if we are not staying true to the conviction of the word of God, we're casting out a lot of lines with no hook. See, but that day when Peter preached, he was casting out the line and there was the hook of the gospel. And so what did it do? It caused them to be cut in their heart. And they says, what do we do? How do we get saved? And notice what Peter says, repent and believe. See, the reality is, is if you don't have the gospel first, there's no need for repentance. Okay? And so if there is no repentance, there is no salvation. If there is no change, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Notice it doesn't say he's a perfect creature. Hey, ain't nobody perfect in the church. Amen. Let's lose that idea real quick that, that we've all got it together and that we're all sinless and that we're all somebody. Hey, we're really a, a bunch of nobodies. Amen. We're, we're really just somebody that knows Jesus Christ is who we are. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's not a perfect creature, but he's a new creature. The old things are passing away, and behold, all things are becoming new. But notice, there had to be a hook. The hook is the gospel. And as we are communicating, as we are walking through life, we need to be sharing the gospel with our children. When our kids, listen, instead of just punishing our kids for their wrongdoings, what do we do? We share the gospel with them. And this is, this is how that we teach our kids right from wrong. And, and, and as we are uh, living life with our coworkers and you know, here's one thing that I, that I hear a lot of nowadays. Man, I, you know, I can't stand my job, and da-da-da-da-da, and, you know, and uh, all these different... Do you understand that God has sovereignly placed you where you're at on your job? And, and on the average that you spend eight hours a day in your workplace, do you understand that's a mission field? Do you understand God gave you that place for a reason that you can share the gospel through your life with your coworkers? You say, well, I can't stand my coworkers. Well, guess what? If they get saved, you might like them a little better. Communicate the gospel to them. Amen. And when their life falls apart and whenever, you know, the, 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 the bottom of life falls out from under them, because guess what? The bottom of life is going to fall out from everybody at some point. And when it does, guess what? God can use you to clearly communicate the gospel of Christ to them. 
But there's got to be a hook. Fishing requires a hook. You can have the best pole. You can have the best reel. You can have the best bait. You can have the best lures that Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's has. But if you don't have a hook, you're never going to catch anything. And the reality is, and this is my concern, this is my concern, and I by no means think that Crosspoint has it all together. I understand, and God dealt with my heart, and, and, and especially in the last couple of days, God's been dealing with my heart concerning pastoral ministry and, and, and my and ways that I've fallen short uh, recently. But here's what I want to say, and I, and I mean this with all of my heart. As a whole, I think we're seeing a lot more people starting to attend church but conversions that are an all-time low. That means that churches are growing, but not a lot of people are being saved. And I wonder why. I think it's because we're missing the hook. I think we're throwing out the line. We're getting good messages. Man, there are some guys that they can get up and they can speak and, and they can ooh you and they can awe you. And man, that's the most amazing thing. And that, I've never been so motivated and I've never been so encouraged. And that guy, he's really, that was just a really moving message. Hey, sometimes we don't need a moving message. We need a convicting message. Amen. This is going to bring somebody out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. That's the way that people are saved. That's the way that people respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the reality is there is there are a lot of different types of bait there are different types and modes and styles of evangelism building relationships and sharing Christ over time or or knocking on somebody's door and sharing the gospel or in an elevator talking about the weather and then move right into the gospel and hey do you know the Lord and and and, and so there's all different types of bait but there's only one hook and that's the gospel of Christ the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's all about what Jesus did for us at the cross. We should never lose sight as we carry the gospel through the world of the cross. Because that's where it all took place. That's where God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And, and, and I think that we need to be reminded. This is basic. I told you, you're not going to hear anything that you didn't already know, but the reality is is that fishing requires a hook, and sometimes when we're coming up empty and, and, and nobody's being saved and people aren't being converted and the churches uh, aren't really growing, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, have we graduated beyond the gospel? Have we moved to a place where we no longer need to preach the gospel, but now we need to go into different areas? And, and Listen, we never move beyond the gospel. If you believe it, shout a big amen. The last thing I want you to see is number three, fishing requires patience. How many know the sad reality about fishing is that every time you throw a line out, you don't catch a fish? I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine catching a fish every time you threw your line out? I mean, everybody would fish, wouldn't they? I mean, you... you Everybody would be lined up, and it didn't matter where you're at, whether you're at a river, whether you're in the ocean, whether you're in a pond, or whether you're in, at a lake somewhere, and every time, man, you threw the line out, and, and, and bam, just hit right off the bat every single time. No, it doesn't work that way. See, your responsibility is this. Your responsibility is to throw the hook out, and whatever happens next is beyond your control. See, your responsibility is just to share the gospel through your life. See, how many know that you cannot force a fish to bite a hook? Amen? You cannot force a person to be saved. Everybody look right up here. I, I want to help you out this morning. Listen, gospel manipulation is not from the Lord. We don't force our kids. We don't force our grandkids. We don't force our spouse. We don't force anybody to be saved. You don't shove the gospel down somebody's throat. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't need your help with his word. God is God. His word is his word. And the Bible says his word will accomplish that which he sends it out to do. God doesn't need you to manipulate somebody to be saved or to become a Christian. And a lot of times what we're doing is that, that, that we're operating in legalism. And we have to be very, very careful that we are not trying to manipulate our children, family, or, or friends because it's damaging. See, we're not trying to, our attempt is not to change people. God does that alone through his Holy Spirit. Okay? And I tell you, as a parent, one thing that will free you is when you realize you're not the Holy Spirit for your child. 
you have to be careful that we do not now we have to preach the gospel we have to we have to share the god we have to discipline our children but we're not that we're not to manipulate our children to be saved i've been very my wife and i've been very very careful with our kids as a matter of fact there have been a few times they said i'm ready to be baptized and man we try to talk them out of it and i'm not i'm not chomping at the bit every time as a matter of fact my son still i don't believe is there and, and guess what? God's going to have to get them there. Daddy can't do that for him. There's going to have to come a place and time in Isaiah's life to where he comes face to face with the reality that Daddy's God has to become his God. Mommy's God has to become his God and that he has to acknowledge that his sin has separated him from God and that he needs to know God for himself. And it's not just about me praying a prayer with Isaiah so I can tell the church and everybody else, oh, look, my son got saved. Did he really get saved? Did God really draw him? Did God really deal with his heart? Is it really genuine? We have to be careful that we do not gospel manipulate our children, our family, and friends. And, we're, and, and, and see, here's, sometimes we're operating in legalism. See, legalism teaches that you need to change to be a Christian. But salvation says God will change you and make you a Christian. See the difference? Legalism says you need to change and then you can become a Christian. But salvation says God will change you and then you become a Christian. Amen? God's the one that does the changing, not us. See, if your children change for you, they'll change uh, temporarily. But if they change for God, they're going to be changed permanently. And, and we have to be very, very careful. We have to learn how to be patient. Fishing requires patience. And, and we have to be patient with others in the same way that, that God has been patient with us. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but God who gives the growth. He who plants and he whose waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. So Paul planted, Apollo watered, and then in due time, God gave the increase. Okay? One plants, one waters, then the rest is up to God. God gives the increase when that time comes. Guess what? There's where the patience is required. Okay? Now listen, every person has a good desire in their heart for their family. I want my family to be saved. I, there's nothing more than I want my children to be saved. I don't want anything more in life than my grandchildren to be saved. And you have to be careful and make sure that you're being patient. Because if you're not being patient, then you can try to help God out and you can start gospel manipulation and you'll do more damage than you will help to the kingdom of God. And what you'll do is you'll push your kids away. You'll push, listen, our kids need to be drawn by God. Our, our grandchildren, our spouse, if you're praying for a spouse to be saved, listen, create an atmosphere where they can be drawn by God. Listen, don't bring them to church every once in a while. Bring them every Sunday so that they can be ex exposed to God and that they can get into the presence of God and God can draw them to salvation. We need the presence of God. And if we're not careful, and I think this, this, especially as our kids begin to grow, and I, I, I'm not a grandparent, so I don't know what it means to be a grandparent. So I'm not going to try to tell you how to grandparent and what to do. I don't know. I'm not there. But what I, knew, what I do know is that grandparents are crazy about their grandchildren. I mean, they say if they could skip their children and go straight to grandchildren, they'd do it just like that. I mean, <laughs> is it true or is it not true, grandparents? You'd skip the grandchildren or skip, skip the children and go straight to the grandchildren. I don't know what it means. But what I do know is that, man, there's a strong desire. And we have to be super, super careful. We have to be patient and make sure God is the one doing the drawing. See, we can bring condemnation. You can try to condemn a person to make a commitment. You can try to manipulate and, 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 and make a person feel really guilty and feel really bad about their decisions that they've made and try to get a quick decision from their life. You know what that quick decision will bring? A false conversion. And a false sense of salvation and security. You have a lot of people who have made quick decisions when they were not drawn by God and now are claiming to be saved. They have no desire for God. They, they, they never go to church. They never read their Bible. They have no desire for the things of God. But because they were forced into a quick decision, they now say that they're a child of God. We have to be careful. 
We have to be patient. In the same way that we have to be patient in, in, in with fishing, we have to be patient as we are sharing the gospel through our life. And that God is faithful, and in God's timing, he's going to reach our children, he's going to reach our grandchildren as we continue to stay faithful, as we continue to live the gospel, preach the gospel through our life. Amen. This was a day that changed their life forever. Peter, James, John, Andrew, they were never the same. Ever, ever the same. Because this day they became fishers of men. And what does it mean? It means that fishing requires going. They had to go. They had to leave where they were. Notice what the Bible says. They left everything behind to follow Jesus. I wish more people would leave the past behind to follow Jesus today. I wish they'd leave it all behind. Some people, they, oh, I'm going to leave this and this behind, but I'm going to hold on to this in my life. No, they left it all behind to follow Jesus. Fishing requires a hook. We have the message of the gospel that will bring people to salvation. And then fishing requires patience. That God is the one that has to save a soul. God is the only one who can make a, a Christian. You know, we can create a lot of things in life, but you can never create a Christian. Why? Because it's something that takes place in the heart. Now, if, it, if a Christian has to do with the way that you dress or the way that you, um, you look physically, oh, sure, we can make a Christian that way. But what do we know? That, that Christianity is more a condition of the heart than it is the outward appearance. So God is the only one who can do that. Therefore, fishing requires patience. I want to ask you this morning, when was the last time you renewed your commitment as a fisher of men? When was the last time that, that, that God brought you face to the face with the reality that God has called you to evangelism, God has called you to make a difference in your family, on your job, uh, in your community, uh, where God has planted you, sovereignly planted you for such a time as this to make a difference with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's bow for prayer.